What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Pack a Day podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. Once again, joined by the one and only Mike Wall. You can follow him at Mike Wall68. Mike, we've made it one week left in the regular season, and somehow, some way, the Packers are now one win away from the playoffs. I hope your holidays treated you well. Uh, any New Year's resolutions? And uh, yeah, wh- how, how's life been? Life has been good. Thanks, Andy. Good to see you. Yeah, we just uh, had a great hol- holiday season. Um, New Year's resolutions. Gosh, I'll, I'll probably keep those to, my, to, my, to <laughs> yeah. myself right now. But but yeah, we had a good, good go of it. It's been fun watching football. I think the only problem with, with New Year's is like, I, I literally will sit and watch more television, more sports than I need to. And uh, it's almost like I got to force myself outside or like force myself into a book or something like that because it just gets it gets really bad around here. Yeah, from the, the like Christmas Day, especially you know you have a Packers game on Christmas Day, and then you've got the whole NBA slate of action. You've got all the college bowls going on. Uh, it, it's just there's so much going on, there's, and it's a lot of good football taking place as well. Um, yeah, it's tough to kind of pry yourself away from the TV at times, but um, I do want to start. Obviously, let's start with the update first. Uh, I'm sure most people know by now, but. Uh, great news on the Demar Hamlin front as we're recording this today. Um, sounds like he is, you know, has some, uh, or like his, you know, at least they're thinking, you know, mental functions, and he's mm-hmm. being able to squeeze teammates' hands, and um, just a really, really sound report uh, for the first time that we got. I think really good news on this situation. But um, I did want to ask you as a former player, um, because I think everyone watching it that hasn't played the game has this immediate response. To, every, everyone has an immediate response to it, right? Because it's just so shocking and traumatic and like, you're just not set up and you're not expecting, you're going into, you know, Bengals, Bills, Monday Night Football, huge matchup. And then all of a sudden something like that happens and it just takes you so far back. You don't even know how to respond to it. But I did want to hear your take on it as a, a former player of just how that affected you and um, your thoughts on the entire situation. I think you make a great point. It affects everybody differently. Certainly there's like, if you start looking at the people who are in the, in the stadium or who are just enjoying, the fans that are enjoying that game, the, the NFL players and coaches around the league, um, then you go to his teammates and then you go to his family members, his close personal family members and friends. Um, it's, when things don't happen the way that, that we schedule them in our mind, like the way when our model gets shattered, that's when we really get affected by things. And so this is an, a Monday Night Football game on national television, like you said, and just your your kind of reality, the model of what you set up for yourself gets shattered. And I think that happens at all of those levels. If you look at it just specifically from like an NFL standpoint, a, a player standpoint, somebody who who commits themselves to a, a act of violence every you know every seven days, right? Um, we all build ourselves up to be invincible. And that's kind of the persona that you that you that you build up around yourself in order to function in this in this league, especially at the con, you know the confrontational contact positions, offensive, defensive linemen, running back linemen, et cetera, or linebackers, et cetera. And I think what happens in all of this is just this you know snap back to reality. You're again, you're, you're, the glass is shattered. Um, you have to you you remember that you're not like life is is very very fragile. Um, I always put myself in the, in the place, or I, I shouldn't say I always, I immediately in this situation put myself in the place for the mom who had to go through that and sitting in the stands and watching their kids. It's very, very difficult to think about. Um, they've, they've been so strong through the whole thing that it's commendable. The, the job that the, the, the techs did and, and, you know, they really, there's only a handful of places that he could have been and that situation happened and he lives because they had the right, the right pieces of equipment in order to, uh, and to keep him breathing. So. Listen, I always take away the same, like tragedy happens every single day, Andy, and, and whether or not it's on national television or not, you know, we all have people in our lives that have, we, we have experienced tragedy in different ways. Um, it's just a, it's a constant reminder that life is fragile, man. And if you're not doing what you love with the people you love as the best you can, then you're wasting your life. Um, and that's just, this is just another one of those, you know, not subtle reminders. Yeah, very much so. Very well said. Um, I don't have too much to, to add on top of that. I, you know, I, I immediately, I don't know if, were you watching the, the Euro uh, 2020 when the Christian Erickson um, yep. collapse happened to, um, that was the first time for me that the Christian Erickson, I actually I just get chills even thinking about it, just like how insane it was at the time where you, again, you're just turning on a game and you see a player collapse like that. And then you see like that one with the Erickson situation, you could see them doing the CPR at times. It, they, they didn't handle that situation well um, on TV because we saw probably too much that, than we, that we should have saw. But you see that and um, 
I still don't even know um, how, how to respond in that situation. But that was the first time for me that something like that had just been like totally taken my breath away. Like I was in complete stunned shock this time when it happened, the only thing that the, the Erickson situation immediately went through my mind. And the only thing that buoyed me in that situation was the fact that, all right, they were able to get Christian, you know, back and he's obviously playing soccer again and everything like that. So I was hoping and hopeful, but man, like you said, everyone responds different. It just, it, it stuns you in the moment. And um, like you said too, these things unfortunately happen every day and it certainly just makes you reevaluate things. And again, well said with, um, you know, if you're not doing the things that you love, if you're not around the people you love, if you're not um, focusing on the things and the people that you love, um, it can be gone in a second. So I, I feel that very much so. Yeah, the only other thing you add, man, is it, it, you see, uh, I hate, I'm on social media. I don't really enjoy, I mean, I don't like it and I don't like it for the reasons that unfold under these kind of situations, right? There's, there's the good side of it and there's the bad. There's the, everybody reaching out and, you know, pray for Damar and certainly we're all thinking about him, put him in your thoughts. Bro. I think that's, you know, listen, when you can bring the community together, it's fantastic. When you have these divisive, um, I don't know if assholes, uh, like Skip Bayless that comes out and, and just puts out something there to get more attention and, and why he wants it to be, you know, when people, you just see where our society is, where everything's got to be about you, regardless of what's going on in the world. And it's like, it's not, it's, it's not his fault. It's certainly, it's, it's a function of how we've, we've developed our, our, um, the way we consume content and, and the, the, the way that we, we feel about our own self-importance now, uh, as opposed to we did maybe 30 years ago, but it, it's just, uh, it's just such a lesson, man. It's like everything all, from these things, you can take so much when you look into the different facets of how people react, how people react as a society, as a community, and then at, at their individual level. It's it, it's uh, a lot to learn, a lot to learn, especially if you got young kids. I know you got kids that are coming up and, and looking at uh, getting, getting their phones here in the next couple of years, man. Something to think about. No, very much. So. I mean, social media is such an insanely powerful tool. And we saw that in two very distinct ways, right? In one way, you saw some of the negativity, the false information, um, the vaccine stuff, like immediately mm -hmm. take form on there. And then you also saw an outpouring of support, like you mentioned, to the point of where what they've raised five, six million now for his you know, foundation. And you saw the, the prayers and mm -hmm. the outpouring of support. So like, you just get it as unfortunately life is there's just two totally different sides and um yeah, everyone has a choice of which side that they want to, to take and um yeah, well said and unfortunately uh you know sometimes we get caught up in the the negatives of stuff i think if you know we can also look at the the positive and, and what we were what a lot of people were able to do to support um hamlin his family uh his foundation the the charity etc and um but yeah it is a crazy powerful tool and like i said we always have the we always have a choice in that. And thankfully there is both sides and not just one side. And we got to see a lot of the positives that came out of that as well. well said. Right. Let's, uh, it's, as tough as it is sometimes to transition into uh, a Packers Vikings game that is uh, completely different than the situation that took place with DeMar Hamlin. I'm still on obviously talks and Packers with you this week. I want to go over Packers Vikings right away before we get into some of the individual details, just what was your biggest takeaway from this game? Keyshawn Nixon's the MVP of this team. Um, it's just amazing. We, we talked about it last week. Probably talked about it the week before that. The week before that, uh, just the impact that he has on the squad. Um, the difference he can make in a game and a special teams player is is Devin Hester like. You know, is Deion Sanders like? It's it's amazing. Probably Devin Hester more so just because of the team, the, the way they manufactured points around him, and the way the field position changes that they made. Um, I thought that Joe Barry did a really nice job of of playing Justin Jefferson in a manner that what made it impossible for him to be successful at least early in the early in the snap early in the uh, early in the play certainly i think it was a it was a confluence of events uh field the, the the quality of the field was you know obviously made it difficult for them to operate on being the vikings that's nobody's fault they have to pick the better cleats but that's that is something that did come into play uh, being on your third string center, not being able to operate in a norm and function in a normal manner, your right tackle going out early in the game, um, those things all have a really major impact on the team that maybe you know goes out unsaid by some of the you know major major pundits. Um, and listen, we talked about it at nauseum with Kirk Cousins. When you put Kirk Cousins in a situation where uh, he's got to drop back 
and he doesn't have the right people in front of him. He doesn't see the rush. He doesn't feel the rush. Holland's got a great sack. Darius Howe's given up three sacks in the last three games, and he probably only deserved one of them. And it's just because mm-hmm. Kirk Cousins didn't see the rush. So um, it was it was a good win. It was a good – I think it was a real morale booster for that defense uh, of the Green Bay Packers, certainly, in the way that they played. And offensively, you know, listen, it didn't start out very – very well, but you know, I think in the second half, kind of understand that you're up a lot, and you get to you get to run the ball more. You get to put the ball in the hands of AJ Dillon, Aaron Jones. It kind of played into what you want to do, I think, as an offense. And so, you know, I think you go back from every single game this year that they've been successful, and you can look back and okay, well, they ran for 150, or they ran for 140, or 130. Um, you know, they, those guys got their carries, and it's not a coincidence. Now, the way that you get there is always going to be different, and this one was certainly different than most. But you know, hopefully that uh, that you, know, you can just continue that to the next game. Yeah, I think I think they found a little bit more of their formula in this game. And I mean, clearly, anytime you can get a pick six and a kick return for touchdown, that's going to help your formula out quite a bit. But uh, it did seem like, you know, just the way that they were overall playing defense, a little bit more team defense, rallying to the football, playing a little bit more physical. Uh, special teams, obviously, you had the block punt, but they responded well from that defensively, at least in the rest of the game. Special teams plays well. Mason Crosby's hitting 56-yard field goals. Keyshawn Nixon's doing his thing. And offensively, like you said, started off a little bit rough. Some of the connection between Rodgers and Watson was a little bit off on a few different plays, uh, but also <laughs> – found the rhythm running the football. I think they ate up 10 or 11 minutes of the third quarter when they had the lead. Um, that part of that's because the, the, they they ran the ball a ton and, and, and chewed some clock. The other is because they only allowed the Vikings, I think, one possession in the third quarter too um, and, and were able to get off the field. So it was just a, a, a lot more complimentary football than I think we've seen. I want to ask you about um, Justin Jefferson in this game. Obviously, Jair Alexander uh, played a phenomenal game, got a lot of credit, deservedly so. You kind of mentioned Joe Barry and the defense that, you know, he kind of played in this game. I know you posted a video on Twitter uh, just kind of showing and outlining exactly some of the things that they were willing to do to take Justin Jefferson out, out of this game. And let's just say it worked a heck of a lot better than it did in week one when they didn't seem to have much of a plan against them. Yeah, I think overall this is probably the best game I've seen Matt LaFleur's staff, you know, Matt LaFleur and his staff coach. And that might, you know, to your point, the way that they rallied on tackling, just the enthusiasm they had throughout the entire game. They were the more physical team on both sides of the football. That's something that we can't always say. Um, there was a great shot on the offensive side where A.J. Dillon was driving towards the, the the goal line. They didn't make it in, but shoot, man, there was nine guys in that pile that were in green pushing the, pushing the stack. So, um Anyway, my hat's off to them. Joe Barry, you know, so Jai Alexander, of course, like talks to talk and, and did a great job, certainly. But what they did is, you know, and they took the near safety. And there's what, what happens usually in these situations is, you know, Justin Jefferson, the hardest route in football to cover is a big route. It's a harder route because it just covers multiple zones. You can go to different depths. So you can just, you can mess with a lot of people. And Traditionally, what happened last week against Miami, what happened uh, last time we played these guys is when you start switching out zones, you have to communicate and you need to pass off. And the safety of the tie has to drive on that dig on that dig route, which is just a 15 or 10 yard crosser. And that guy can't catch up to speed. They can't catch up to Jalen Waddle. They can't catch up to Justin Jefferson. So there's two problems. One is like just physically you're not fast enough. And the other problem is you have to communicate the switch. And they took care of both problems. They just said before the snap, we're going to bracket this guy inside and out. Jerry Alexander is going to have everything, to, you know, north, vertical and, and outside of, of uh, Justin Jefferson. And they are literally going to turn the, up, the, the near safety and face him. They're not going to backpedal where they have to drive. They're literally going to turn and face him. They're going to turn the body 45 degrees and play like you're almost playing like basketball defense. And now everything looks different to the quarterback. Every looks, everything looks different to Justin Jefferson. As soon as he makes that break, they break as soon as he makes his cut, they break on it. Kirk Cousins doesn't have a route. They know that the back safety, the safety on the far side, has him. If he decides to run like the bang eight or he decides to run the, the post route on the, on the high post route, the backside safety is going to be there along with Jerry Alexander. So they've kind of covered all their bases for all the in-cutting routes. And they're just saying Jerry Alexander can cover literally everything else. He's that, he's that good a player. So when you take away that first, that first option, especially when that option is leading the, the National Football League in receiving yards, I think you really put – Kirk Cousins yesterday or in, in or on Sunday in a bad situation, particularly because guys like Rasul Douglas and company, they did a great job of covering everybody else. I think that's not, you know, Adam Thielen had one catch as well. Now the tight end Hawkinson, is he going to get off a little bit versus our linebackers? Yeah, of course he is. But it's like, I think it was like seven catches for like 60 yards, something like that. Like who cares? Like we'll give that up all day as long as 
we get rid of that first option, Justin Jefferson. The way that they ran that, that's not a true, like, you're not running cover two. You're not running – you're literally turning your body and saying, we're going to bracket this guy. You're not going inside on us. That's that's a big departure from what usually happens in that situation. Very much so, and a huge departure from week one. And I'm more of the mindset, too. And I, I, there, There's been the mindset, even like going back to Michael Jordan and, and Shaq, of like, hey, they're going to get theirs. Just make sure you stop everyone else because they're not going to put up, you know, enough to do it all on their own. I'm more of the, uh, hey, if anyone else beats you, tip your cap and, you know, we'll see you next time. Um, and that's kind of what they did in this game. Yeah, Adam Thielen and uh, TJ Hawkinson, they've got some good players on offense. Delvin Cook, obviously, but you just can't let Justin Jefferson go in and put up, you know, 180, 200 yards like he's been capable of doing. Um, and if you, I, I went into the game, you know, I, like I said the day before, like if they could hold them to like 80, 90 yards and a touchdown, I would have felt like, all right, Green Bay's got a legitimate chance at this game. So to hold them, what, under 20 yards on one reception, um, not sure it's uh, going to be repeatable every time, but they had a great plan for him and it was a, a really, really well executed plan as well. Yeah, and you think about the Vikings throw the ball like 65% of the time. I mean, they, they really, as, as good as Dalvin Cook is, they really don't run the ball that much, you know, yeah. to be fair compared to the rest of the league. Um, what was interesting about this game is like it, there's it's, there's there's so much that goes into that week, right? So Jay Alexander starts and says this, this is a fluke. So, so okay. now you have this thing going, right? And, and he's out there. He's put himself out there. And I'm just going to tell like fans at home, like it takes brass balls to do that against the, against the best receiver in the league. Like I think he, the guy for me is not my cup of tea as far as all the celebrations and all, you know, how, how much, you know, attention he seeks for himself. But it takes brass balls to go out on national TV and be like, this, it was a fluke. He's never going to get that again. And then go out there and have a game plan and everything and back it up. What was interesting in the game is we showed this on the On My Block show. We, we broke down about six or eight of these clips. And there was one clip where Amos didn't turn his body the right way and just started backpedaling. And, Jared, and that was his one catch. So he, he caught it, ran the dig, ran the, the quick in route, sat it down. Uh, Amos didn't didn't bracket him the right way, and you could see. See, they made the tackle, and Jair got Alexander got up and started talking to Amos like you did it wrong. Like we're not, we didn't want because he didn't want to hold him to anything. He didn't right. want him to get a single thing. And he and you take away that one play, which is literally like that's the difference between success and failure. Is your body position goes from here to here. That's literally the difference in the play. That's how that's that is the that is the margin of error in the National Football League with high level players. Yeah, and certainly with Justin Jefferson. That was a really fun game to watch. Like, I, I hope we get more of that moving forward because uh, the, the dynamic between those two with Jair and Jefferson, how passionate they both are, how talented they both are. I just hope we get more of that. I know, again, Green Bay bracketed them and there was some double coverage and some different things that they gave, but that's just a fun matchup. And I'm, uh, I hope we get to see a lot more of that moving forward. And obviously both are um, probably going to be on their respective teams for the foreseeable future. So we should, but that was a fun matchup. Um, one of the things we talked about last week, Mike, uh, was the play of the tight ends. And you had mentioned Robert Tunyon uh, as somebody who's doing his, uh, you know, doing work in the, the run game and the, the protection game as a, a blocker. Um, hadn't really received some of those big plays as of late. He responds this week. He's got the big uh, touchdown in the corner of the end zone that Rodgers hits him on. And then they kind of get him loose on the little rollout play and he's rumbling down the field. Got to see a little bit more from Robert Tunyon in this game. And then Man, our guy Mercedes Lewis did it again. He he had a phenomenal game blocking. Yeah, he's a great player. And, you know, it, it's so – what's interesting about, you know, the Packers in particular is, like, he's probably the second best blocker on the team behind Bakhtiari. I mean, he probably he is. He's, he's, he's that good. Um, and I, I think what, when he's gone, fans will, will finally recognize – because every once in a while, he, like, he made the block on Daniil Hunter. He made it twice, but the one was just really, really good. They're both standing up, and he's got – he has to take the edge. And – there's like, I don't know, three guys in the league can do that at the tight end position. Mark Andrews, Kittle, and him. I mean, I, I don't know if anybody else can do that consistently. No, I don't think so. and, and, and so it's it's a very, very unique skill set that he has. Um, it just goes widely, widely underappreciated. He's, he's been one of my favorite players, honestly, for the like, – I, I told you this story before, but I, I cut up teach tape on him for the, when he was playing for Jacksonville for, for guys in Miami when I was working in Miami. He's, he's that good. He's that special. And um, – Tanyan, it was great to see him get some. Look, anytime you see a guy trying to like, I'm I'm all about guys just you know player development, better yourself, better yourself, better yourself. So when you see a guy really working to better himself, and then you know he's not getting the catches, and you know you got, that's how you get paid at tight end, blah 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 blah. And then you see him like things are going well, he's working hard. It's not perfect, but he's working harder. He's trying to get better, and now he's getting 
he gets the touchdown off of a broken play. He gets the he gets the, the twenty yard near twenty five yard catch down the you know, he runs down the sideline. He just picks up a couple here and there, and all of a sudden his numbers look okay now. You know, yeah. you pick up fifty yards and a touchdown. That's a good day. When you're able to do that, you just feel happy for the guy because he has been working to try to improve himself, and you don't get to see it, and people don't appreciate him because the numbers aren't there in the receiving game. Well, a lot of that's out of his control. And I think as a football player, and Mercedes Lewis is probably the epitome of this, when you understand the gears that you can turn, when you understand the things that are under your control and the only things that you should be worried about are those specific things, like the process of development and, and what you can what what you can do in the game given the plays that are being called around you, like – that is such a powerful mindset to have as a professional athlete. And I think it's lost on a lot of the guys. So I, I, I'm glad to see guys like Tunyon kind of stepping up and, and just trying to correct the things that they, they can correct. Totally agreed. And speaking of a player stepping up, really want to get your thoughts on TJ Slayton this week. I know with Dean Lowry going down, Devontae Wyatt was the player that, you know, kind of everyone's eyes was were, were focused on uh, because first round pick, everything like that. But Man, Slayton, two batted balls at the line of scrimmage, pushing the pocket, was involved in the goal line stand at the beginning of the game. Uh, certainly not a, a perfect uh, performance by any stretch of the imagination, mm -hmm. but uh, he had a he had a major impact in this game. Yeah, I think the defensive line overall played well. And listen, guys want to see Devontae Wyatt because we talked about this before. You have to watch the tape. If 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 Devontae Wyatt's playing better and Devontae Wyatt's head is, is improving, there's nothing wrong with what he's doing. He's a first-round yeah. pick. He's probably 22 years old. He's improving. If he's playing better than these other guys, he'll play. That's it. That's the only way he plays, especially when it's it's you know we call this nut cutting time, right? In January, in in, in December and January, um, Slayton played really well. You know, being able to penetrate against and it does it help that you have you know these guys that are inside an interior offensive line? Yeah, but like that's not his problem, right? You go out there and you perform. Um, I thought that if you look at what was one of the bigger sequences in the game? You have to say early on the fact that you can make a goal line stand. He was he was a big part of that certainly. And then Devontae White was a big part of that on the play before that. You know, Devontae White crashed down the the tight end. He had nowhere to go, and then that allows Preston Smith to come in there and, and break the back of the center as he tackles the running back. So, um, I like the effort that I, I think again when you look at the totality of what happened as on. The defense in particular last week, you have to say that was the best job coaching and preparing those guys to play as you've seen all year. Could not agree more. Going back to Wyatt for a second, I think one of the reasons why people have wanted to see him a little bit more and are kind of a little bit more anxious is because he was actually an older rookie, 24 years old. Mm -hmm. He'll turn 25 in March. So not usually the the, the Packers MO. Usually they draft the 21, 22-year-old guy. <laughs> and then allow him to develop over time. I think the the thought process with Wyatt was, oh, wow, they actually drafted a 24-year-old guy. He's going to be able to come in and be able to make a little bit more impact. Um, but it, it all takes time. And I, I'm with you. I actually think he's shown signs of progress and that you can see him out on the field continuing to improve. This is his first extended action of the year. Once again, far from perfect, but I actually saw some positives that I think he can take away from this game. Yeah, uh, he's an explosive player. He's got there's a lot of upside. You see the talent, um, the technique's not there. The the football intelligence is is just going to continue to grow. Listen, once you get these guys in the building, it's really a question of how much time do they want to put in to to kind of master their craft, right? And there's just a bunch of stuff that goes into that. But like, how much time are you going to do aside from just practice reps and aside from just film study with your coach? Like, how much other stuff are you going to do? How much are you picking up from the veterans? How much time are you spending watching film so you know all the pre snap tendencies? Like, how you know how much are you working on your technique so you're playing lower and you can automate it so you can make more decisions? Like, how much time are you doing all this? That's really what determines how successful you're going to be in this league, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know to the extent that, you know, Kenny Clark helps him or, or the, the, the the defensive line coach spends extra time with them, like all of that factors in. And sometimes you have control of that and sometimes you don't. And sometimes you're in a place where that's part of the culture and sometimes it's not. And I really couldn't tell you whether it is or not here, but I can tell you that you get you look at a guy like Aaron Campman. Remember Aaron Campman? Aaron Campman oh, yeah. was Aaron Campman was a, a an afterthought for four or five years. And then I'll never forget, I was in Carolina and Tauscher called me and Tauscher's like, dude, Aaron Campman's going to kill it this year. He's beating me. And Tauscher never lost one-on-ones. And Aaron beat him a couple times in training camp. And he's like, dude, I don't know what happened, but it clicked. And when it clicked, man, he was all pro for two, three years. Yeah. So it just, you don't, you don't know what that time schedule looks like. And that was, you know, that was Aaron working his ass off for years and years and years and not necessarily getting the help that he needed. Because he wasn't a high draft pick, he didn't have that kind of cachet. So you just don't know what's going to happen from player to player. But 
the, 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 the environment that you're in does have a huge impact on that. And hopefully he's in an environment that's conducive to him developing it at a fast rate. I'm hopeful that it will be. I think that it will be. We've seen some signs of improvement, and I still, I'm still high on his overall upside moving forward. But that'll be one to keep an eye on moving forward as well. Uh, let's transition over to Packers Lions. Obviously, massive game Sunday night football. Playoffs on the line for Green Bay, depending on what happens early in the day with Seattle. Possibly playoffs on the line for the Lions. Um, for me, a couple things that I'm really going to be watching. I wanted to start with the battle of the trenches. We just saw Carolina run right down their throat a couple weeks back um, in a cra you know, crazy performance. Lions couldn't stop them at all. Um, I also know that the Lions offensive line, and you posted a couple clips as well. Sewell's playing well. Um, and you know, I, they have the ability to run the football right at you as well. Swift and Williams are a great one-two punch. I, I think this kind of, as it does most week, but I think even a little bit of more of an emphasis this week kind of starts in the trenches. Yeah, if anybody wants to see just an absolute dismantling of the, the the Detroit Lions defensive line before this game, check out our Process to Perform channel on YouTube, man. Because the 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 the, the Carolina Panthers, uh, you know, it's it's about it's about technique, it's about aggression, and it's about finish. And these guys just did it in spades. Uh, schematically, it was it was it was a good game plan against that team, but they just ran through them. The Lions are not very good at tackling. Um, just as just an aside that makes it difficult to be a good defense right. but uh when you think about the lions have the best offensive line in in the nfc north and it's and it's probably not even close uh frank ragnow their center is is the leader of that line he's incredible they have good players all over the board um the lagards and brown's been playing well um both both tackles are, are high level players but his only continuing to get better he has great feet for such a big man and they just do things um from a schematic standpoint that are uh, that play to their strengths. They have guys that can get out and run. They do a lot of double team base blocks with pulling with pulling linemen, with pulling tight ends. They have two guys. It's, it kind of mirrors uh, Green Bay in, in AJ Dillon and Aaron Jones with the, with with Williams and Swift. I mean, they just have two really really good running backs that could be starters on other teams. And, and Williams is having obviously the best year of his career right now. Um, it's going to be a big test, I think, for our defense just in general, but certainly up front. With the talent they have, because they when they like when they double team guys, the guys get moved. I mean, just that's that's how it works. And they're 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 good at what they do. Their tight ends do a good job of blocking that, but their tight ends kind of in the same category as ours, where they're they're enthusiastic blockers. You know, take away Mercedes. We talk about Deguari, talk about tight end. They're enthusiastic blockers that can get the job done with double teams and point of attack stuff. But they really scheme and understand the you know how to attack man man coverage in the run game versus zone coverage in the run game. And they're like they schematically they just do things that make a lot of sense. It's going to be a real challenge, and then, you know, defensively for us, man, uh, we should, we sh and we said this last time, but you just look at them on paper; they're not good at anything. I mean, they're really not good at. They give up the most yards in the league. They're not good at anything on defense. And the one thing I keep going back to when I watch their tape is, they overrun plays, they misdiagnose, they have communication errors in the run and pass game, they play a lot of man coverage, but they don't tackle well. I mean, it's just it's one of those things where the you know you just kind of think to yourself, we should be able to score a lot. But on the other hand, you have to score a lot, man, because they – I know they don't score a lot away from Detroit, but they are averaging like 27 points a game. Like It's it's no joke. They're a good offense. And to, to go to your point with needing to put up some points on offense, you go back to that game, and we, we, we talked about Minnesota in that first game where the, the offensive line consisted of Newman and uh, Jake Hansen, et cetera, and then this week they had their full complement of players. In that Lions game uh, at wide receiver, you had Christian Watson um, – I think play 17 snaps in that game only. And he had not mm -hmm. made his breakout game yet against the Cowboys. Romeo Dobbs looked like he was going to have a huge role in that game, catches the the first pass over the middle, and then he goes down with the injury. So Dobbs and Watson play a combined 18 snaps in that game. Meanwhile, Sammy Watkins, Amari Rogers, and Samore Toure combined for 107 snaps on offense. So yeah. I do think that there is a portion of this offense that the Lions haven't had the opportunity to see. And I honestly think that the difference in this game could be Christian Watson and Samari Toure if they can get open and cause havoc in that secondary. Yeah, they play a ton of man coverage and they play it all over the field. And, not, and honestly, they're not great at it. You know, they give, they give up a ton of yards in the passing game. Um, they've got they've got a young guy now, so obviously they have Hutchinson, but they also have this kid James Houston who's come on playing really well at the edges. Hutchinson's actually much more effective now at playing like three technique in their in their uh, in their nickel looks than I think he is at the edge. But when you look at kind of how you want to attack this team in the passing game, 
listen, like the Bears showed it. Like when you when you motion to bunch uh, versus a, a tight split on, on you know on either side, and they have to switch off guys. Like they just don't do a good job communicating. They lose people in coverage all the time. You can beat them on dig routes. Um, you 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 can beat them on 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 play action pass. Their linebackers suck up really bad. They over pursue. Uh, you know, there's there's just opportunities all over the board. It's just a question of can you put like Christian Watson in particular in a position where he can run setter goes, go routes. Can he can he run across the field? And can you can you occupy that backside safety long enough to get the ball off? Because they, they will be like he was uncovered or he was he's been open for for a number of plays in the last two weeks, we just haven't connected. And I think, you know, Andy, that's part of the, the important part of the offense though right now is it doesn't even, it, it would be great to connect all of those, but you just have to throw them. Like they just, yeah. the defense has to understand that we're, we can stretch the field when the defense understands that everything else softens up. So I think that's a big part of the, their offense, regardless of whether they connect or not. Obviously the connection would be optimal. Very, very much so. And I think if they can hit on a couple of those, it's obviously going to make things much easier for the offense overall and just put a lot more pressure on that Lions team. Uh, I was going to bring up red zone, but I think everyone that's listening is probably sick of me talking about the five times that they had uh, inside of the you know, 23 yard line that they end up with three total points. Uh, but any other keys that you can see to this game that you think are going to play a, a major role between Packers and Lions? Uh, turnover battle is going to, it's just like the last game. I think turnover battle can, you know, is, is really the key to this game. Um, you know, the red zone, listen, they, again, it's, it's crazy, but they're kind of the same team all over, all over the field. And the opportunities that you have on the 50 yard line, you're going to have on the 30 yard line and the 20 yard line, obviously the field gets compressed, but you can put your players in positions to beat their players. You can, you can put Christian Watson to beat Jeff Okuda. Like it, it will happen and you will have a one-on-one -on -one matchup. And can you win that matchup? That's really what this comes down to. It's going to come down to a lot of execution. I'm Ben. I know Ben Johnson, the coordinator for uh, the Detroit Lions. Man, the guy is like the guy is Mensa smart. He's done a great job. Jared Goff is playing really, really high level football right now, and Jared Goff can put the ball anywhere he wants at any time. And they have four receivers on their team that can stretch the field and make plays. And so this is this as long as let's say the field conditions are are equal and and you know it's not going to be slippery and all all that all those conversations like if this is you know a neutral on, a, on a, a, as neutral a field as you can get this is going to come down to in my opinion the ability for the pass rush to get to jared goff and get him off his first read and get him to move around because he, he doesn't move great they put him in they do a really good job of the detroit lions i'm talking about of moving him off his spot and creating different launch points but if you're just talking about flushing the pocket and making him throw on the run not very good at it right so if you if you make it so he has to get on a second a second uh, receiver and he can't set his feet, I think that's the best chance of being successful. These guys make plays in the secondary if you allow them to. They got four good players in the secondary and two really good running backs. Yeah, they have the the full complement of weapons on offense for sure. And I know Matt Lafleur's made mention of that before. Of like, if you let Jared Goff have time in the pocket, he, he has the ability to to beat you and and you know, kind of tear you apart a little bit. But if you get him off his spot, not too dissimilar to Kirk Cousins, um, it's a totally different quarterback. So I'm sure pressure is going to be key this week as well. I had two quick ones for you. I've been asking this question. I've seen a variety of different thoughts on it. Which Lions team would you be more afraid of? one that has the ability to still get in the playoffs or one that is able to play free and loose and doesn't have anything to lose going into the game? Oh, uh, the one that has something to play for. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no matter what kind of motivator you have with Dan, um, the guys know if they're going home the next night or not, yeah, or if they have a chance to play. Uh, there's, um, when you're at this level, this isn't like the Super Bowl, right? This is a game to get into the playoffs. Um, pressure is either applied or received. And guys at this level aren't going to receive a lot of – they don't feel that much pressure because they're playing a game to get in the playoffs. They're excited for the opportunity. So I don't think you would see an uptight team because they had a, a chance to get into the playoffs. I think they're going to be ready to go regardless. But certainly if they have something to play for – um, there'll be a handful of guys in that locker room. They probably weeded them all out, but there would be a handful, usually of veterans in the locker room, like, man, I just, I'm tired. I want to get home, you know, if, if they know there's no future. But if there's a future, man, they're going to fight really hard for it. That's fair. I I was leaning the other way, but I think you may have uh, changed my mind on that one. Um, last one, you had Yash start at right tackle. 
And then Zach came in from because Yash had a little bit of an injury issue, although he was cleared to return, played on the field goal units, um, was able to go in if there was another injury. Now you've kind of got the situation of Yash or Zach at right tackle to start this week, assuming both are e of equal health, which we don't know if that's going to be the case. But assuming both are of equal health, who would you rather have starting at right tackle? Uh, Yash, he's got more experience at right tackle, I think, at this point than Zach does. Um, I think Yash is anchor in the passing game. I that map a little bit better. Uh, I, I think they're probably equal in the run game um, right at, at this point. I think over time, Zach will be better. Um, but they're going to get a lot of combination blocks with John Renu Jr. and Mercedes Lewis. They do a lot of things on the back side and the right side of the line that uh, make sure that, you know, neither they're not going to be singled up that much as far as like run in, in the run game. Um, so I, I, I would kind of base it on who I think is the better pass protector against that kind of player. And I think for me, that's probably Yash at this point on that side of the ball. Yeah, I don't disagree. I think it's a nice problem to have that they have both of those guys. I think I would go with the player that has a bit more experience and has shown a bit more and it is more of a natural right tackle um, than maybe Zach is at this point. But I wouldn't be upset if they decided to go with Zach. But and like I said, I think it's a good problem, but would probably lean, lean Yash uh, slightly as well. The thing, Mike, the thing about the thing about that, though, is Andy is like not only is it if you put Zach in the game and for whatever reason, Bakhtiari gets hurt, Something happens. Yep. You know, where his knee flares up. Now you got to switch two guys, and 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 that's I I, I probably am coming. You know, you, in the back of my mind, I'm probably thinking about it that way too, right? Like, good point. We talked about I, I talked about this with somebody else yesterday, but you never want to if you don't have to move two positions, you just don't want to do it. Like, even if you're getting incrementally, you know, like worse at one and versus a gap in the other, it's just like you never you just want to move one if you only have to move one, and if you do that, you might you might argue that you're getting worse at two. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because now now you can have Zach kind of focus on both spots throughout the week. If if something happens with Yash where his injury flares up again, you can have him going at right tackle. Yeah. If something happens with David um, and his knee, you can have him going at left tackle. Um, yeah, he's, he probably just becomes the super sub in that situation because he probably goes in at left or right guard too, I would assume. So Yeah, I think I would think so, yeah. Yeah, and maybe even center at this point. Who knows? But um, – yeah, I think that's probably the right way to go. Start your five and then have Zach be the super sub if anyone needs anything that you know, goes down with anything. So, Mike, phenomenal stuff as always. Any final thoughts before we get out of here? Not nah, to be good game. It'll be a fun weekend to watch. I think there's a lot of games that have some some sort of playoff impact. So uh, buckle up. <laughs> buckle up. Back to the TV for a couple days. Um, and then, of course, we get the national championship on Monday too. So it should be, should be a, a wild week of football. Mike, where can we follow you on Twitter and where can we find the podcast? Yeah, check out uh, MikeWall68 on Twitter and TikTok, uh, Process to Perform on Instagram. And then on my blog podcast, go to youtube.com backslash Process to Perform. That Process to Perform channel has all the on my blocks. And we do a block party uh, session every week with deals with um, trench warfare, offensive, defensive lines across the league. I talked about it. if you guys want to check out that Detroit Lions dismantling versus the Carolina Panthers, it's on there. It's a It's a fun. It's a fun watch if you're a football fan. Listen, for those of you who are here watching the Pack a Day podcast every day, uh, I know you are football junkies. And just like me, you cannot get enough film and enough of the breakdowns. If you're not checking out Mike's film breakdowns every week on his podcast, you are completely missing out. So make sure not only go over there, but make sure to subscribe, like, comment, and help that out as well. Uh, also follow Mike on Twitter at MikeWall68. Mike, appreciate you a ton. Hopefully we'll be talking next week about a playoff matchup for the Green Bay Packers. Seemed improbable, but now they have the chance to do so. Can't wait for this weekend. I'll be right back here tomorrow with an all-new episode, so make sure to check that out as well. But until next time, and as always, go Pack Go!